Kasim, thank you very much for coming into the studio. It is the company, oh, really, arguably here. of the moment yeah. here in Europe, at least. And look, there's a lot that goes into the holdings business, but Novo Nordisk is the standout. The sales, of course, of WeGovi and Azempic last yeah. year, powering the returns for you. What do you do with the cash pile that you're now sitting on? Yeah, well, good question, because obviously, as we think through our strategy for the coming years, and actually 23 was the last year of our five of our prior five-year strategy, so now we have a new strategy in mm. place called Strategy 2030, and the big theme there is scaling. Uh, how do we absorb uh, the phenomenal inflows that are going to be coming our way uh, from the great success of Novo Nordisk, and indeed the success of Novo Nessus as well, our other operating company, make sure we absorb those inflows, reinvest them, and hopefully generate the attractive returns that we've been able to do historically. And you've already pulled the trigger, of course, on, on a big ticket deal, 16.5 billion US dollar acquisition of Catalent. How confident you, are you at this point that that deal goes through, that antitrust regulators approve it? Yeah, look, I can't comment on that. The regulatory processes are, are what they are, and, and they've got to play their course. What we know is we have to be patient. So if we look back a year ago, uh, we merged two of our portfolio companies, Novo Nordisk and Christian Hansen, to form Novo Nessus. Mm -hmm. uh, that regulatory process took over a year. Uh, so uh, I think all we can do is obviously be patient uh, and make sure that we cooperate fully uh, and transparently uh, with the regulator and hope for a closing uh, as soon as possible, obviously, uh, to give clarity to our customers and indeed to the what, employees. What, what does as soon as possible look like at this point? What is, what is the approximate I, yeah, time frame? I, I, Tom, you know as well as I mean, these yeah. processes take months yeah. and, okay. and it is what it is. Yeah, sure. Are, are you slightly irked when you hear Eli Lilly's CEO, one of your key competitors, saying this should be referred to antitrust regulators, to competition authorities. Does that, does that get under your skin? Well, at all? You, you sort of get used to it, right? We all compete with each other vigorously, and Eli Lilly has been a formidable and much respected competitor to mm. Novo Nordisk for many years, right? We are the two world leading insulin and obesity, obesity companies. So, a, a bit of back and forth between Lilly and Novo Nordisk is par for the course. Okay, and the idea is you take three of these Catalan factories yes. and you sell them to Novo Nordisk. That's the, that's the plan. What Correct. do you do with the rest of the Catalan business then? So, so the rest of the Catalan business uh, is one uh, that we like a great deal. So the whole area of what we call biopharma services. So if you look at the golden era of innovation that we're in pharmaceutical-wise, that... That innovation needs servicing. It needs things, uh, companies that are called contract research mm -hmm. organizations. It needs uh, contract manufacturing organizations, and uh, as well as many other services. So we're heavily invested in this whole biopharma services arena. It's one that we like. It's one that's core to our strategy. And Catalan fits very much in that. So we look forward, actually, uh, to hopefully, as soon as possible, getting our hands on that business, investing mm -hmm. behind it, and getting it to its full growth potential. Potential. And we're very excited by that growth potential, not least because we firmly believe that the biotech industry is off the bottom uh, mm. from the downturn that happened uh, back in uh, late 20, uh, early 21. We're seeing IPOs come back, which means more funding for the industry, which means more need for contract development manufacturers. So we're feeling pretty good about things. Okay, that's interesting. If, if for some reason the deal doesn't, doesn't go through, part of the rationale for the deal, of course, is to ensure that that capacity that so far Nova Nordisk is, isn't able to match the, the the demand, huge demand for, for its products around, around the obesity drugs. Can't match that demand quite yet. I know they're investing very heavily around that. Part of the rationale of Catalan is to help that. If for some reason it falls through, what is the playbook then to support Novo Nordisk? Well, look, Novo Nordisk, I, mean, I think as the CEO of Novo Nordisk himself uh, has said recently, uh, the Catalan move is, is one piece of the puzzle. There's a host of other initiatives that are taking place uh, to build capacity. There's a lot going on from an organic perspective in terms of uh, expanding facility uh, in existing sites, uh, both in Europe uh, and in the U.S. So, uh, you know, Catalant is, is an important piece of that, but by no means is it the only piece of the puzzle, and a host of other initiatives are underway. Okay, and it, it sounds like you want to be holding on to the, these drug production facilities and these assets for, for the future. Is that, is that part of, this is a part 
part of a longer term, longer term strategy? Yeah, well, look, we're a long term investor, right? If we look at who Nova Holdings are, uh, yeah. we are very much focused on generating attractive long term returns. If you look our at our track record with the assets that we do own, it's about long term investing and investing for the growth for the full growth potential of those assets. So mm. yes, does sixteen point five billion? It was notable in terms of the the, the, the price tag. Does that mark the start of kind of new multi billion dollar deals for Novo Holdings? What, what does that tell us about, uh, about pricing that you're looking at? Tom, somewhere in the middle. I mean, I think uh, Catalan, in many ways, uh, for the strategic reasons you uh, alluded to in relation to Novo Nordisk, is a one off. Uh, that is not the size of transaction that we've been doing. It's not the size of transaction that I expect us to be doing in the foreseeable future. Having said that, mm. if you look at the inflows coming our way in the coming years, we do have to scale and we do have to do bigger deals to put more money to work. So what I would expect in the coming years is for us to be doing bigger investments than we have done the previous five. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they'll quite reach uh, that level of, uh, I mean, 16 and a half is... Yeah. Uh, is is on the very big side and that 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 I would put in the category of one off at least for the next five years or okay so. interesting what are the criteria or the metrics that you're looking at when it comes to potential acquisition targets that have to align with your longer term view so look I mean as any financial investor we're looking at generating the right kind of risk adjusted returns mm -hmm. so uh, when we do these investments we have our IRR targets but importantly we're we're focused on certain sectors where we believe that our strong heritage in life sciences where our long rooted and deep insights and network can add value we often say that we bring more than just capital to our investments and that's because of the heritage that we have uh, in the life science arena and there's a handful of sectors that we feel uh, we have an edge and one of them is the biopharma services sector whether you're talking about CROs or CDMOs okay the bi the biopharmacists uh, biopharma sector with it within life sciences the biopharma services, services sector the services Se sector yes, yes. is a particular area yes. of focus when yeah. it comes to deal making yeah. what about when it when it comes to the green green transition you're looking to 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 allocate what between you're going from 2% of allocation to 10% by 2030 do you meet that and what specifically falls into that category yeah. what are you looking for within green transition investments Tom very good question because if you look at our strategy, our new strategy 2030, uh, in many ways it's more of the same with the exception of scaling, i.e. putting more money to work. However, we have called out a couple of new areas uh, where we are going to be doing uh, investments in a slightly different way and one of them is green technology investing. So there's one area where we've been investing heavily for the last six years and where we're arguably the world leading investor and that's in bioindustrials. So that is biotech solutions for industry, a very important area area for the green transition. Three years ago, we went into infrastructure, green infrastructure investing, and we recently formed a fund called Glentra uh, that is uh, focused on uh, green energy investing. But we've recently made a decision as part of Strategy 2030 to invest in green tech and decarbonization technologies more broadly, regardless of whether they have a bioindustrial uh, platform mm -hmm. or not. So we're going to be doing uh, classic recycling, alternative packaging, et cetera, et cetera, without necessarily the, the, the biotech angle that we've always focused on historically. So a big area of focus for us, a big push, and not only because it's important for the green transition, but because we firmly believe that there are going to be some very exciting returns to be generated in that area. Kassim Kutu, we've run out of time, but really appreciate your time today coming to the studio, CEO, of course, of Novo Holdings, on how you're thinking about deploying some of that capital. Tom, really thanks. Your time. Thank you Thank very you. much for having me. Having me.